Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast, the podcast where I, Paul Frampton, interview senior marketers on the big issues of the day and the thing that they want to see reset with an ever-changing landscape. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Time for a Reset. This morning on a beautiful sunny day in mid-June, I'm joined by Seb Bardin, who joins us from Coca-Cola. Seb is uh, in-store experience marketing lead. Coke has recently joined there from Unilever, where he had a number of different roles in digital leadership, cutting across digital product, things like Cleanopedia, working on the e-commerce side, working on digital marketing. So he's transcended a lot of the kind of newer disciplines within marketing at some very big companies. He's also worked at Sony, Shell and Symantec. So I think we've very much got an expert in what the areas are that are growing and developing in marketing. So I'm really looking forward to this chat. Welcome, Seb. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. So we always start with the same question. If there was a big red button on the middle of the table that you could hit reset on something in the marketing discipline or the industry, what would that be? I think for me, you know, again, I guess it's based on the experience. And my first two years at Unilever, I've been working in an amazing team made of ex-consultancy. And it was always about building new businesses. So even if you're responsible for website.com, responsible for data capture, it was always about business. For me, the reset a bit that I will be clicking on the mindset, resetting the mindset that we as marketer, as digital marketer, it's about building business and what can we bring to the business. So again, it, there's a lot of things going into this type of mindset. So of course, there is this appetite to be curious, to always learn, curious about the data that we see, always, you know, questioning things. But also there's an element around uh, people as well, trust the experts and delegate to people that you trust to a wider team, but also bring automation when it's needed. And the last bit about this mindset for me is about, you know, be excited about the job that you're doing. So for me, as you summarize it a bit, what I've been doing so far, my passion is digital on my Work life, private life. So yeah, it's just bringing this passion to do on a daily basis. So I guess some of the big FMCGs that you've worked at are renowned for training people in how to put marketing at the core to build businesses. But maybe one of the challenges in those businesses, because they're so large, has been adapting to new technologies and new channels. But you've been one of those people that's always been at the forefront of those. So what are the mindset challenges that you've had to deal with in a very large company? I think what you do is almost like what a startup does inside a big organization, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, that's right. It's really about accelerating the digital agenda and also to drive growth. The way I see it is to drive business growth and then to drive value for the consumer. So I wouldn't say it has been an easy ride. And of course, you know, you have different teams, politics on the top, and you have you know, different uh, KPIs or chaos, and also teams that are talking to each other. I think if there was an interesting start in marketing week yesterday or the day before about marketing teams taking decisions without involving other teams. And I think this is a little bit one of the big challenges that I've seen. So how can we get this integration between, especially in e-commerce, between a commercial team and the marketing team? And also, what is the KPIs that we need to have? So often in marketing, we'll be talking about our attention, our visibility, and so on. While on the commercial side, we are more interested in our commercial element, gross margin, e-market shares. So again, it's really aligning, first of all, the KPIs together. And then the other bit is also demystifying the technology part are in technology. So again, one of the big projects I've been working with at Sony was around bringing in-house a DMP, for instance. So, you know, how are you going to talk about all the technical side of a DMP to a commercial team, to the VPs, to, you know, to the board level while getting it done on the other end? And the learning as part of this is the language that will work, resonate to all of us team will be, you know, how much are you going to bring more to the business? how much savings you're going to bring to the business and what is the value you're driving to the consumer. So is it better personalization, better product offering and so on? Right. That's really helpful and really good to understand because I think whether it's the marketeer or the marketing department or the partners or agencies that often work for brands, I think the critique of not talking in commercial language has always been there and the translation to be able to directly show the impact that marketing strategies have on, as you say, not necessarily acquisition, but maybe on LTV or kind of a basket value. The e-commerce area, the digital area has the ability to tie together cause and effect a little more easily than maybe some of the other 
disciplines within marketing. And is that one of the things that attracted you to it, that actually the analytics is much easier to kind of show a line of sight between you spend this, it does that? <laughs> I guess that is a little bit of a universal language when you talk to a VP for a region. And at Sony, some of the challenge that I got was definitely around it. So I can take an example of we did back in 2015 an amazing project with a company called Hooklogic that was bought by Criteo, which is the foundation of a Criteo for retail media and amazing campaigns. I think we had a very good return on advertising spend. Showing the result to higher management, not interested because the margin on this product was so low that the investment that we were making into advertising while it was driving a good ROAS, it was not driving profitability. So again, for me, it was about understanding all these financial terms, moving away from ROAS, from what we'll be talking in marketing clicks customer acquisition to really language that matters to the business. So that was a very good learning and also having this line of sight and also align and just understanding what margins we're making for each other product that we have. Right, which is, as you say, exactly how those running commercial teams think. They think about all of the different levers to drive ultimately better profit. And there are a lot of vanity metrics in the advertising world that aren't particularly helpful. So I guess you've also had to get pretty adept at building business cases. I mean, you talked about the DMP case at Sony. I guess quite often you're suggesting new stuff. And whenever you suggest new stuff, it tends to require investment. So how have you built relationships with commercial and finance teams to actually get them on side with some of the projects that you've been driving? I would say probably two elements as part of it. That's the first element, which is more about, I wouldn't say test and learn, it's more test to scale, which is really identifying one market, one retailer, and then work really closely with a local team or get the independence to work to test the project independently from a global or from a regional perspective to show markets and to show first our stakeholders what is the value of this. So again, it's about this not afraid of failing type of mentality, which is also linked to building new business, but also really being future-proof, going against competition. So yeah, there's the ways of working, the relationship building with the stakeholders. And then the second element for me is the support that you're getting from your sponsors, from your managers. First of all, it's about making sure that they trust you, trust in terms of what you're doing, have clear objectives, and then make sure that the fights that you can't with special companies that are very hierarchical, let them fight this on your behalf. But I think it's important to have a really good set of sponsors within the organization that are buying into your ideas, but will be also pushing it to various potential blockers along the way. Right, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, getting things done in businesses requires lots of people to help nudge it through and influence it because there's probably... 50 things that could be done, and you've got to be the one or two that get through, haven't you? So you've obviously touched on e-commerce, you've touched on retail media, so I'd love to steer towards that. But maybe before we do, I just wanted to touch on, I guess, this overall shift that we've seen in the last few years towards direct-to-consumer D2C. I guess during the pandemic, it felt like everything was about new, slicker, faster D2C brands stealing share from some of the bigger manufacturers, whereas it feels like two, three years on, Many FMCGs have caught up, maybe not in all aspects, but at least they now have meaningful e-commerce strategies and they have D2C operations where there is at least some form of test and learn, as you said. And in the meantime, we've probably also seen a lot of D2C struggle because they can't get repeat purchase. They can't actually make profit from some of their promotional early customer acquisition attempts, or they lack investment, or the money dries up, or even just the inflation in performance marketing channels that makes it pretty hard to run a business when you don't quite know how much you're going to pay to acquire a customer. So you're obviously pretty close to this space. Like, what do you see happening right now in this space? Again, is you can take it from a big organization point of view. And I think the most important element, however we go or not in the DTC space, if you have money, you can just buy an organization and then you get the product in place and you just deliver it. But I guess the, for me, there are two ways to look at it. So the first one is, of course, Yes, it won't be a big channel for you because especially in FMCG, X, you are, you're talking about more than 70% of your sales happening in the brick and mortar environment. So the first approach is to look at DTC because again, the cost to entry now is so low. You know, you have Shopify, the Shopify model, or you can go to have your marketplace model or your THG model, whatever model you can choose. But the way I see it, it's really an opportunity to offer something that 
the consumer won't find anymore. So, for instance, Sony, they had a DTC model. The way we're using it, it was mainly for super fans. So, you know, when you have a new phone coming out, you know that these people will go on our DTC platform and then buy the product. And this is a way to reward those fans with additional incentive, of course, to collect first party data, but also because you know that these fans are loved or brand. This is a way, especially for high expensive product, is about getting a repeat purchase on a regular basis. Every year we have a new phone etc. If I'm looking at it from an FMCG perspective, again, this is the tricky bit because yes, of course, you have your super fans. You can also look at different models of whether you want to offer bulk buying. I think Coca-Cola is doing this. There's also the e-commerce mod- B2B model, which is something that Unilever is doing really well. So it's called the new pro, which is mainly attracting small businesses to their platform and then to sell everything online rather than going to the traditional route in that space. The second way I'm also seeing this is also about more as a test and learning. So a way to test new products. So if you want to launch a new product in the market, you can just use a DTC approach to see whether there's an appetite from the consumer for this product. And if it's working, let's scale it up to brick and mortars, to pure play, etc. And then the other bit is the last one for me is about you know first party data. So yeah, of course you will get a higher margin if you own the channel, but I don't think you know we can talk about a big person percentage of sales happening in this area. So what else can you maximize? And I think, you know, capturing first party data to enrich your audience, to enrich your database is a good way to look at it as well. And as I said, the barrier to entry is so low now. Yeah. Although the talent and the skills you need are very in demand (laughs) and very difficult to find. (laughs) That's true. That's true. (laughs) Yeah. So the barriers are low, but the ability to succeed, I think, is probably underestimated given the complexity. So there's a lot in there, Seb, and I would love to come back to that first party point in a second. But how do you or kind of in your new role, which is obviously called in-store experience marketing, how do you think about the traditional world of shopper marketing and partnerships with retailers, which has always been there? It's always been a core part of how a Coke or Unilever have got their products to market. And then this new e-commerce world with retail media packaged around it, where it's either sponsored search or off-site using first-party data, it feels like they've almost been two different worlds because you've had very commercial people designing the joint business plans. And then you've got new people, (laughs) often in different teams, to your point, developing e-com and people that are good at retail media are generally very good at audience planning and data and all of that kind of thing. So how do those two worlds come together in a big organization? And is that part of your role to do that? Or are you more on one side, the digital side. So yeah, it's definitely, that's the reason why I moved to this role. It's, of course, improving the shopper experience online, but it's also about improving the shopper experience in a physical store. So these are the remit that I have as part of this role. And I think what I find exciting, again, in this new role, it's about more of a consumer behavior nowadays, where you will go to your Sainsbury's while you will have your mobile phone on you to look at your shopping cart. But you can also go on the Sainsbury's app to check pricing, to check reviews, to check information about the product. So definitely the online experience is still living in a physical world. This is an opportunity to connect both worlds together. So now we know we saw a lot of examples via QR codes, near field technology, communication, push notifications. So definitely I remember back my days at Shell when we were planning an out of home campaign, you know, you will have the same message as part of your out of home. But nowadays, you know, especially with digital out of home, programmatic out of home, suddenly we were having a different message when our out of home was located next to a car from a house versus where it was located on the M4, for instance. So because your know, proximity of the phone really next to the stores and then, you know, messaging, the messaging has to be more uh, different and really trigger the consumer to go to a closed car from a house and ask for more information about the phone, but also have the sufficient information like, oh, there's a discount happening right now on this one. Why don't you explore this? Yeah. Right. That kind of whole connections planning the customer journey, the integrated omni-channel customer journey, what you're saying and the fact that that should be integrated feels absolutely where it should be. I guess the problem is the market moves from absolute specialism. It's like we need to really hyper-focus and be a startup to get this to work to now we need to integrate it back together. I think it's a really interesting dynamic, isn't it? That we go through these cycles within businesses of this is a very specialist skill set. Frankly, whether it's inside a marketeer or inside an agency or a consultancy, the same thing happens that if you're going to be an expert in generative AI today, then you're probably only going to be thinking about generative AI. You're not going to be thinking about how 
generative AI connects with other parts of spatial computing that because there's so much to learn just in that one space. So it feels like you and your career have gone very deep in specialisms, but then broadened out like into this T-shaped or even M-shaped, I think people call it now, where you've got quite a few different deep skills, not just one. Is that something that you think consciously about is how do I make sure I'm an expert, but also I can horizontally connect things together? Yeah, that's a little bit of a thing with this. I guess as someone with dyslexia, you're looking at things a little bit in a different way. So again, for me, you know, again, while there's a lot of weaknesses that, you know, you need to use different strength and different part of your brain. And curiosity was, for me, a way to keep improving my skills. When I look at some of the career profiles, you know, people are saying, oh, I'm ex-Google, I'm an ex-Twitter, et cetera. So for me, I've always looking at, you know, what do I want to be a future of? And from the beginning, I want to be a future chief digital officer. Future ready. Exactly, be future ready. This is how you know, I'm shaping a little bit my career because, again, the way the, from the beginning, I saw the potential of digital. So it was not about, you know, the banners, it was about search. It was about driving revenue for the business and enhancing the consumer experience. And we're going into some amazing opportunities with AI, for instance, in terms of you know, driving more efficiency. So I guess it's now digital by itself is touching on commercial, it's touching on technology. So, yeah, it's just yeah, more and more fields, but we're not traditionally part of digital, if you see what I mean. So, yeah, that's a little bit where I want to go, but also how I keep learning new things and bringing new elements as part of my development. Now, that's great. And that's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about my career. I did a very similar thing trying to be up to speed and understand the new, but then to be a translator. I think often people talk about being specialists. I think the best people are the translators between the old and the new, between the departments that don't know how to talk to each other. That is the most powerful skill in the business between senior stakeholders and day-to-day teams. Like I don't think we have enough translators or connectors within teams. So yeah, no, it's interesting to hear that you've thought about that in your career as well. So If we could maybe come back to the first party data audience piece. Now, obviously, within a Coke or a Unilever, generally, you have much less customer data for obvious reasons and have always relied on the retailers for insights. But there's obviously been lots of efforts and you worked on many products in Unilever to create contact points through digital, but also collect data and trend information. When it comes to building that into a structure where you can do what you said, where you target people in a moment, whether they're in store or whether they're in proximity to something, how much are you thinking about building audience management platforms and customer data platforms? Is that a realistic ambition given the volume of data you have today or is that something you're working towards? Sometimes we, there is always this target, oh, we want to acquire 1 billion data or you know, 100 million data. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And the second bit is there's this question about scalability. So I've seen both sides of the balance. And again, for me, in terms of a data acquisition, the question is more, why do we want to do data acquisition and what for are we going to use it? Yeah, of course, it's important, you know, to know more about the customer, to know, you know, what type of product they're using. I've seen that in some cases, yes, it's driving efficiency when we do media, media buying, for instance. So you're driving down your CPU. You can increase your ROI as well because these people have been engaged with your brands. Uh, but on the other side, I was saying that it doesn't really change the needles. The retail data was so powerful, especially in the case of Amazon, that there's no point using your first party data apart from you know doing negative targeting. First of all, when we are talking about data acquisition, as a brand, it's what value first are you going to give to your consumer? And in a lot of, I've seen, we start usually with our, let's do something but let's do vouchers in exchange for data. But again, now the connection between the consumer and the brand is really focused around promotion, around freebies. Is it the right level of the world of data? But what we've done at Univ, I think on VB, that was a good one. It was, we were operating, let's say, in a neutral way. So we were not really saying that we were part of Unilever. We were not advertising about product. It was tips and tricks about cleaning your house. But in the back end, yes, based on the articles that you will be reading or you will have a persona associated to you. So let's say if you're reading about using vinegar to clean my sink, it shows that uh, this is more, you know, someone interested in more natural product without a lot of chemicals, for instance. So, so definitely 
if there's a point here, oh, let's try and try to push our portfolio that is relevant to this audience. So yeah, it's really, first of all, I guess for me as part of this approach is, yeah, it's to understand the objectives. Where are we going to use this first party data? And then, you know, what is the value exchange that we want to collect and the quality of the data? So rather than having a big target of collecting X amount of data, where 70% of this data won't give you the right insights, but you need to move the needles. That's really interesting. In a lot of the work we do, I think often there is, like you say, that big target of getting the volume. And then there's not necessarily the thought in the strategy early on around the granularity of data required for it actually to be useful for a use case, because you're collecting it, but what are the use cases? And of course, between the technology and marketing, often the marketing use cases aren't entirely understood by IT teams. So we see a lot of need for translation there to go, if that's where you want to get to, you need to actually collect slightly different types of data, and then you need to connect it together in a way where you can actually use it easily and frictionlessly. And that can often be quite a long journey because it involves a lot of stitching together, involves a lot of different parties internally and with partners. And quite often, I think trying to build the business case and the support for that can be quite challenging because it can be quite a long-term project. I see you nodding a little bit. Is that something that you've seen yourself? Yeah, your point is also, yeah, we have a MarTech bit in the back end as well. So yes, collecting it making sure that we are adhering to all the privacy policies as well from a legal perspective. And then the, on the other side is how to deploy it. So you have all this, this DMP and then you can go into more of a DCO space, a dynamic creative optimization space. And then there's another element, which is a platform space. So if I put my e-commerce ads on, I can take the example of Amazon. So sometimes you have to invest into Amazon search or into Amazon DSP display, which is the element of first party data. So when I show the results to the commercial person, my ROAS with search tends to be usually two to three times higher than my ROAS to our DSP. So for oh, let's put all our money on, on search. So again, it's more you know, finding the right balance, but also use the, the first party data in the, the right way, not necessarily linked to just purchase, but also more consideration to purchase. And at the end, use technology again to look at everything in a holistic way through a multimedia mix attribution model, etc. That makes a lot of sense. So zooming out, how have you seen a lot of the areas we talked about, the kind of more data-driven test and learn, e-com, retail media? How have you seen that data and technology analytics approach impact the whole marketing operating model within a big FMCG? Like, is it just additional skills or is it changing the focus areas? Because it obviously always used to be very much brand management down. But how do you feel it's changing the marketing operating model for FMCGs overall? It's definitely additional skills because yeah, the data strategy is key because on the earlier you have so many data. So it's about what type of segmentation do we need to have to get this. But especially when you have a lot of brands, a lot of products, it's also mapping, really going to this granular level of mapping of the data. Probably let me go back. It's more what are the pain points for each product that we have that the data will allow us to answer if that makes sense. An example, for instance, is we did this at Unilever. So we have a product to do laundry, which is for washing machine. While the washing machine penetration in this country is around only 30%. So from the analyst side, so okay, let's try to capture data of washing machine owners. Then we go into the content production side to develop articles about washing machine owners. And then, you know, amplify this on all the different channels. So it's more really going into this, identifying what are the pain points the product will help the company. With. And then we have data that we can't buy elsewhere or data that would be unique to us. So again, like washing machine ownership is something that you won't be able to get on a Facebook or on a Google type of solution. Yeah. And as you said earlier, you can get it and then you've got to think about the consent and whether you actually have the right to market to those people. And if you connect it together with another data source, is the consent still there or not? I mean, we do a lot of work in the retail media space. And of course, the more granular and daily the data, the more valuable. But in order to get that data, clearly, sometimes you need to go through quite a lot of privacy hoops and reconsenting. And by the time you get there, and then you deal with the actual match rates to put it into some kind of CDP or activation platform, you can often be talking about quite small numbers. Whereas in North America, where you're starting with hundreds of millions of audience, the numbers still have scale. So I think in Europe, we're still a bit nascent in some of those spaces. And the digital identity piece is definitely something that I think has to be cracked, right, for this to be a scalable solution. That's right, yeah. So 
going to change tact as we come towards the end, Seb. So we touched on in the middle of the interview that you'd made some very specific decisions about how you develop your career and stay future ready. People sitting here are probably thinking, well, Seb knows all of this stuff. He's got all of his acts together. I can't be like that. I haven't worked at Unilever. I haven't worked at Coke. I don't have those kind of experiences. So could you maybe share some of the things that you're personally working on and any advice that you might have for people listening, thinking, how do I make sure that I do a similar thing and stay future relevant. When I started, I was always thinking that the best way to move is to be good at what I'm doing. And then the more and more you move, you're conditioned with school, with university to work to get the highest mark. And this is how you're rewarded. I know it's based on meritocracy, but in the business world, it's more about the relationship building element, the more emotional, intelligent side. So understanding people, be more, more empathy. So this is something I'm still working on it. I would definitely recommend this type of approach because some organization things are so big. So again, it's about understanding the others, not necessarily talking to people, but also so listening to people, listening to the challenges, listening to the opportunities, and dealing with them how to get things done. But at the end of the day, it's a constant learning to deal with people with different backgrounds, with different objectives. Yeah, well, particularly when you work with such a diverse team across lots of different markets. And when you're behind screens a lot of the time, trying to read signals and work out whether people understand or whether they agree can often be much more challenging, right? So that emotional intelligence and the listening and the really focusing in on people and asking questions becomes really important. Yeah, things around getting global role or regional role, having this market visit to make sure that, oh, did you get it? Do you need any help? Offering help, so that works really well. So that's something I was doing at Sony and I've got my previous manager at Sony was a big advocate of this. And we managed to turn things around in a quick way, even if it's a day trip to Amsterdam, a day trip to Madrid, but at least, you know, having this face-to-face personal connection. You can't replace that. It's impossible to replace. Yeah. Great. Well, and I think when I listen to what you say to some of these questions, it strikes me that you really have this learning mindset that people often talk about. And I think people hear that, but a lot of people don't really do anything about it. I think it's about owning your own development and really leaning into finding out yourself. There are too many people that wait to be told, but I mean, the resources that exist today are exceptional. You can learn practically anything if you look hard enough on the web. And I think some of the younger generations coming through, that's the way they learn through just short form bits of content that they find and YouTube videos, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you learn through other means, but I like what you've said about don't wait for it to come to you. You should go and actually start to develop your insight and learning yourself. And then you're going to be much more relevant to those conversations. I mean, the people that are spending time playing with chat GPT and learning how to ask different questions are probably the ones that are likely to have more opportunities in the future rather than just thinking, this could take my job. I don't want to go anywhere near it. <laughs> For me, again, is reading long articles. It's something you get based on time of the day. You know, you don't have time. And one of the things that I do on board every morning is, oh, what are the top five trends in digital marketing and summarize it for me? And this is how now I'm getting my news in the morning rather than going on, you know, off the board. It saves you a lot of time. And it doesn't mean it's the only thing you'll do. It doesn't mean you're going to rely on it for everything. But as a tool, it's so powerful. I think the test and learn agility, acceptance to use different software and tools in order to do your job, that mindset coming back to where you started, the mindset that what you knew yesterday is not as relevant tomorrow and what you need tomorrow, you need to learn for the next day. I think everyone would do well to keep that kind of change mindset. And everyone says have a growth mindset. But I I think a lot of people don't really understand what it means. So I like the way that you've made it real for people. Oh, thank you. But again, let's keep you away from boredom. And <laughs> and I guess this is also something you know, I just want for my kids also to do, you know, to learn, just want to understand how things are done. <laughs> right. And it helps when you have passion, like you said, you've got passion in this stuff out of work as well as in work. That definitely helps. So look, I think we've come to the end of the interview, Seb. So I've really enjoyed the conversation. We've gone all the way from having the right mindset, how within a bigger business, you think about driving growth and anchoring to the right business metrics, not to marketing or advertising metrics, and then talked about how we need to integrate the older shopper marketing with the newer digital skills and retail media, the importance of data, and then come full circle to the need for continuous learning and a learning mindset. So I think we've covered a lot of ground. So thank you. 
Uh, thanks for having me, Paul. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Time for a Reset. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. We'll be back talking to a senior marketeer very soon. Make sure you don't miss out on any new episodes by subscribing on Apple, Spotify or SoundCloud and leave us a review at timeforareset.co.uk.